Hello and welcome back to our 2017 educational webinar series. I'm Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive comp compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. Today, we are so pleased to have Mike Midgley back of Swiss Re Corporate Solutions discussing risk management considerations with prescription drug abuse. Mike has over 25 years of experience in the healthcare industry. He's an experienced healthcare risk manager, nurse, insurance professional, and New York licensed attorney. He is the vice president uh, of the healthcare risk engineering for Swiss Re Corporate Solutions in New York City. He earned his Juris Doctor from Fordham, his Master's of Public Health degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Nursing from Rutgers. He is the 2017 president of Ashram. Mr. Midgley is a clinical assistant professor at Stony Brook University of Health Technology and Management, where he teaches advanced practice for risk and safety officers in the Master of Science in the Patient Safety Program. He has author, authored risk management articles, including education modules for the Nursing Spectrum Journal. He routinely provides risk management lectures locally, nationally, and for international audiences. All right, go ahead, Mike. Okay, well thanks Jill and welcome everyone uh, today to this uh, presentation. Um, we've got a lot to cover. Um, hopefully we can get through it in an hour, but um, let's get right to it in terms of our learning objectives and the agenda. So we're going to talk, we're going to start off and talk about prescription drug abuse in the U.S. and specifically the impact on healthcare providers. Um, I'm then going to go into some of the common errors that are made in prescribing controlled substances and then follow that up with some thoughts on mitigating the liability exposure for inappropriately prescribing. And then I'll get into some of the appropriate monitoring, so the monitoring piece for patients uh, that are on opioids. And then we'll finish up and we'll talk a little bit about the regulatory oversight um, of prescribing uh, controlled substances. So there's, there's no question uh, we have a problem in the U.S., right? I mean, everybody agrees that we, um, based upon all the data that's coming out of the CDC, that we have an epidemic uh, in terms of opioids. Uh, and, you know, it, it, in terms of, of the U.S. initiative, we are taking it seriously, and we're implementing meaningful safety initiatives that are saving lives, you know, and there are many contributing factors for the epidemic um, of death and addiction with prescription opioids. So I just wanted to, to take a minute just to, to get a bird's eye view of exactly what we're talking about here. Um, uh, and you know, not that it's anything uh, you know new for a lot of the uh, providers that are that are listening and participating in this uh, webinar. But I just wanted to, to to emphasize that it touches all walks of life. So let's let's begin uh, with a bird's eye view of the problem with prescription drug abuse and. The epidemic, it really involves all walks of life. So here's three examples, right? So first we have a grandmother. Now she's from a middle class suburb. You look at her and the fact that she's a heroin addict wouldn't be the first thing you would think of, but she was a heroin user. Her addiction began in 2000 when after she had a hip injury and surgery, a doctor prescribed her basically anything and everything to relieve the pain. So this included a high dose of OxyContin, and her prescription was later reduced, but by that time, she was already hooked. So on the black market, OxyContin pills cost on average $80 each, so that was more than she could afford to cover her six-a-day habit at that time. So she began selling her pills and using the proceeds to buy heroin, because obviously heroin on the street is a lot cheaper than $80 for each of these pills. So if, if from out of nowhere, grandma now became a heroin addict. So next, and in the middle, we have a 16-year-old boy. He was a high school honor student, um, and a friend of his gave him a pill to try. It turned out that that pill was methadone, and originally the methadone was prescribed to a woman who had advanced cancer, and when the woman died, her uh, widowed husband, he didn't know what to do with the pills, so he basically just stuck them in a box and put them in the back of a closet, um, and later those pills, well, they went missing. So they somehow ended up with a friend of this 16-year-old boy, 
and the friend gave him a methadone pill to try, and when the 16-year-old boy came home, his mom picked up on the signs of drug intoxication, including uh, his pinpoint pupils. So she took him to the ED where he was treated for intoxication and sent home, but then shortly after, um, more respiratory depression set in, and this time, um, when the mom finally did find him, uh, he was dead. And then the last picture there, all the way over on the right, uh, we have a football star athlete who got hooked on prescription opioids following back surgery. So he was taking up to 800 prescription opioid pain pills per month at his worst and became suicidal and he would pop a handful of pills before going to bed and he would hope they wouldn't wake up. Uh, so it really was, was pretty bad. So he began taking and building a tolerance to prescription painkillers just to get through the toll and the, you know, the grueling schedule of an NFL season. So at first he was prescribed about 100 prescription painkillers a month, uh, an amount that quickly escalated. So he had three doctors where he obtained his prescription. And between that and the illegal means of obtaining pills, his habit ran into a $2,500 a month tab. So these examples, they paint a picture of prescription drug abuse and how it impacts all of us. So that's all walks of life. So it's been argued by many that we're prescribing too many opioids in the U.S., right? And I don't think anybody really can argue that. I think the, the data is pretty, pretty clear on that. So the CDC, where most of the data from this presentation comes from, so their data shows as opioid sales have increased, overdose deaths from opioids have also gone up. So drug overdose death rates have never been higher. Since 1999, the amount of prescription painkillers prescribed and sold in the U.S. has nearly quadrupled. Yet, and this is really interesting, there has not been an overall change in the amount of pain that Americans report. It's essentially unchanged. And you know what? That's pretty concerning, to say the least. So the CDC also tells us that we have seen about 165,000 deaths since 1999 from overdoses related specifically to prescription opioids alone. According to the CDC in the U.S. alone, from 2000 to 2015, 91 people died every day from drug overdose. Think about that, 91 people. And of those, 44 of the 91 deaths are caused by prescription drugs. So that's pretty much half. And the preliminary CDC numbers from 2015 show overdose deaths tied to prescription painkillers. So that's, you know, Vicodin, Oxycontin, so forth, rose 4% to 17,536 in 2015 alone. So that equates to 48 deaths per day in 2015 caused by prescription painkillers. And in 2012, the Substance, Substance Abuse and the Mental Services Administration, they estimated that among Americans 12 and older, 1.8 million started pain reliever use, 1.4 million started tranquilizers, and 166,000 started sedatives, all for non-medical purposes. So there's a strong argument that we're over-prescribing painkillers and over-prescribing leads to more abuse and more overdose deaths. 259 million prescriptions for painkillers in 2012, and that's enough for every adult in the U.S. to have a bottle of pills. But you know what? It's not all gloom and doom. Just last month, the CDC reported that opioid prescribing is down since 2010, but it really varies a lot um, all across the U.S. So in the report that just came out in July, Actually, it was June, late June. They reported that between uh, the years 2006 and 2015, the amount of opioids prescribed in the U.S. actually peaked. Okay, um, and in 2010, um, there were uh, the you know the average per capita was 782 mme, so the morphine milligram equivalent, and then it decreased each year after that. So through 2015, down to 640 mme per capita. And um, prescribing rates increased from 72.4 to 81.2 prescriptions per 100 persons between 2006 and 2010. And then were constant in the years 2010 to 2012, and then actually declined to 70.6 per 100 persons from 2012 
to 2015. So that's a 13.1 percent decline. Yet the amount of opioids prescribed in 2015 remains more than three times higher than in 1999, when the amount prescribed was only 180 morphine uh, milligram equivalent per capita, and is nearly four times higher than in Europe. You know, and that's based upon the 2015 data. So additional data from that specific report from the CDC is that the high dose opioids prescribing, so that's defined as a daily dose of 90 uh, MMEs or higher, um, was stable between 2006 and 2010, and then declined from 11.4 per uh, 100 persons in 2010 to 6.7 in 2015. So also reported with substantial variation uh, in 2015 at the county level, from an average of 203 MMEs per capita in the lowest quartile uh, of counties, to all the way up to 1,319 MMEs uh, per capita in the highest uh, quartile. So half of the U.S. counties have seen a decrease in the amount of opioids prescribed from 2010 to 2015, but the highest prescribing counties still prescribe six times more than the amounts of the lowest prescribing counties. So um, the counties that had the highest prescribing rate had similar qualities in them, such as a greater percentage of non-Hispanic white residents, um, a greater prevalence of diabetes and arthritis, and a micropolitan status. So that's, you know, small cities and, uh, and big towns, but non-metropolitan, and a higher unemployment rate. So from 2006 to 2015, the average duration of opioid prescriptions increased by a third, so from 13.3 to 17.7 days. And the, the new data suggests that fewer patients may be initiating prescription opioid use, whereas patients already prescribed opioids may be continuing longer and longer term use. But we all know that pain medication, it really plays an important role in managing some types of pain. And the problem becomes that some healthcare providers are overprescribing, particularly for that chronic non-cancer pain. And there's, there, there's very little data that long-term opioid treatment improves chronic pain, function, and quality of life. So data actually supports that long-term use of opioids is associated with, um, with abuse and overdose, particularly in those higher doses. So in large part, the improvement with prescription drug abuse in the U.S. will be led by the prescribers, right? So there was a study, and it was published in the Clinical Journal of Pain, and it looked at knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs of physicians regarding prescription drug abuse. So half of the 1,000 U.S. Uh, primary care doctors surveyed mistakenly believed that the abuse deterrent pills, so those that, that they can't be crushed and snorted or injected, are less addictive, are, are addictive um, than standard narcotic painkillers, so, you know, the opioids. A third of the doctors also said they believe that most prescription drug abusers don't take pills by mouth as intended, but the research actually has shown, however, that the overwhelming majority do. Many fewer snort or inject prescription painkillers, um, and all of the doctor surveys believe that the prescription drug abuse was at least a minor problem in their communities, and more than half, that 55% felt it was a big issue. So overall measures that could potentially reduce narcotic painkiller abuse were widely supported. Nine out of 10 strongly supported limiting patients who get narcotics to just one prescriber and or pharmacy. Uh, which would restrict the number of pills they could receive. 98% support contracts. And two-thirds of the doctors said they strongly supported contracts in which patients agree to use their medication as directed um, and not sell or give it to anyone else. 90% supported urine tests for, uh, for chronic painkiller users to, to monitor the appropriate medication use. 88% supported requiring prescribers to check a centralized database prior to prescribing. And then we've got 82% that support restrictions on marketing. So it's clear to me that prescribers are verbalizing that they're on board, um, on board with making the needed changes. But really the jury is still out as 
you know, these changes in practice, they're going to require a lot of extra time and energy. So here I've got, so since um, um, this uh, field work in March of 2016 um, in this National Safety Council survey, they found that of the 201 board certified family and internal medicine uh, physicians who spent at least 70% of their time seeing patients in uh, an office-based setting and treating patients for pain, roughly all of them, just 99%, are over-prescribing opioids. <clears throat> As they're, um, they're issuing prescriptions for longer than the three-day recommended uh, period. And I'll get into that in a little bit, uh, in a little bit in terms of the CDC recommendations. Um, but three days, uh, was, was basically the recommendation. 23% of them prescribing at least a month's worth of opioids. And evidence shows that, uh, you know, 30 days or longer actually has, um, evidence has been seen that it, that it uh, causes the brain damage. 74% incorrectly believe uh, morphine and oxycodone are the most effective ways to treat pain. And research actually shows over-the-counter painkillers like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, etc., offer the most effective relief for acute pain. So this tells us that doctors overestimate the effectiveness of opioids. 99% of doctors have seen a pill-seeking patient or evidence of opioid abuse, but only 38% usually refer those patients to treatment. And, and, and 5% uh, treat them for abuse themselves. 71% prescribe opioids for chronic back pain and 55% prescribe for dental pain, neither of which is appropriate in most cases. And 66% are in part basing their prescribing decisions on the patient's expectations. However, a previous National Safety Council poll in 2015 showed that 50% of patients were more likely to visit their doctor again if he or she offered alternatives to opioids. And then we've got 84% of screen for prior opioid abuse, but <clears throat> only 32% prescribe for a family history of addiction. And that family history is a stronger indicator of potential abuse. We also know that there's an opportunity for greater education early on. So as we train the up and coming physicians, right? but only 25% of medical schools teach about chronic pain. Um, and during uh, the four years of medical school, the average medical student only receives about 11 hours of pain medication training, right? So this is all based on the Association of the American Medical Colleges data. And I actually recently was told by a friend of mine who's a veterinarian that vets get about 80 hours of pain management training in school. So to me, that seems a little upside down. So we've got to put a focus on all prescribers, not just physicians, because obviously we have nurse practitioners, we have PAs, we have other providers that are prescribing opioids. And this research, the researchers at Stanford University School of Medicine found that opioid overprescribing is not limited to physicians. So they analyzed data from 2013 for 808,000 um, individual prescribers. And in 2013, most opioids were prescribed by healthcare providers and family practice. So that was 15.3 million prescriptions. And internal medicine, 12.8 million. Followed by nurse practitioners, 4.2 million, and PAs, 3.1 million. And the top 10% of opioid prescribers accounted for 57% of all opioid prescriptions. So these results support a remediation plan for our prescription drug abuse epidemic focused on initiatives targeting all prescribers throughout the industry, including the NPs and the PAs. So now I want to focus on some of the common errors in prescribing opioids and several risks mitigation strategies. So, I mean, let's face it, we're not going to work every day with the intent to do harm. We're not oblivious to pain management, but there's a good argument that we can use greater education and may fail to do everything that we can do to prevent unintentional abuse, addiction, and overdose. So the most common errors associated with prescription, um, with opioid prescribing for, for non-cancer, pain treatment 
include these four bullets that I have up on the screen now. So that's inadequate screening for safe and effective opioid use. The inability to monitor adherence, improper selection of opioids, and insufficient consideration of comorbid conditions. So if we start off with inadequate um, screening, let's think about this particular scenario. So think about the middle-aged man who lives in a shelter, right, goes from shelter to shelter. He's got a history of asthma and chronic low back pain. He's admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. Now, his PCP had previously prescribed him uh, high doses of long-acting morphine, oxycodone, and neurontin for his lower back pain. He admitted to selling his prescribed opioids and buying Valium and methadone on the street because he felt like those gave him better control for his pain. So on a recent admission to the ER, um, and after consulting the hospital's pain service, his PCP switched his meds to methadone, hydromorphone, clonopin, and effexor, um, and discharged him with a two-week supply of medication and scheduled a follow-up visit that was to occur in like 10 days. Unfortunately, it was a weekend, right? Uh, and the discharging hospitalist uh, was not able to speak directly with the PCP, but he sent her an email with the medication changes. Um, but five days after discharge, uh, the patient died from a likely unintentional opioid uh, benzodiazepine overdose. So this particular scenario, the case provides a good teaching tool to assess several important issues. So there's the initial assessment in managing the patient um, with this chronic non-cancer pain. And that always needs to involve establishing the diagnosis, the medical necessity, and the treatment goals, right? So that's pretty basic. But we need to do an assessment for depression and the tendency towards substance abuse dependence and an assessment of the pain level and the functional ability. So if the patient has a history of drug seeking or selling, consider close monitoring or follow up after discharge, as well as tight limits on the patient's prescription. If the patient's currently abusing substances, the provider, uh, the provider really needs to assess and treat the underlying condition as well as the substance abuse. So what I have listed here is a stratification of patients from the low to medium to high risk, and that's essential for that initial treatment period. So patients with concurrent substance abuse uh, and high risk for abusing opioids, they're obviously put into the high risk category, right? That's a no brainer. So high risk patients must be monitored frequently with repeat assessment with, um, with the prescription drug monitoring program. Um, perhaps with random urine drug testing and even random pill counts. So use the low-dose opioids, so not any combination opioid therapy for these patients, and wean them off the opioid um, if you're seeing atypical uh, behaviors. So in the example that we just talked about in terms of the middle-aged middle -aged man uh, from the shelters with chronic low back pain and asthma and so forth, this patient had significant abuse patterns and should have been considered as high risk, right? And consequently should have never been initiated on high dose opioid therapy, uh, high dose uh, opioid therapy. He should have been appropriately monitored and should have been weaned off the opioids to refer to addiction management. So risk assessments and uh, validated tools can be used really well to stratify, uh, to stratify our patients objectively. So examples are, and these could be found on the internet, are opioid risk tool um, and screening and opioid assessment for patients uh, with pain. And we're going to look at a couple of these in a, in a little while, but those are a couple of examples. And you could quickly do a Google search and find them. So patients prescribed opioids should be monitored continuously for adherence and adverse effects, as well as screening for abuse. And urine drug testing may actually be effective. So what, is that, what does that help us with? So it informs clinical decision making by prompting new conversations, right, between our patients and, and ourselves. So it helps identify patients who are non-compliant, right, or abusing uh, a prescription or illicit drugs. It also helps us get informed consent before prescribing opioids and determine how to monitor adherence. But the monitoring um, of the interventions will not tell us the provider 
Um, it, it, you know, it's not going to tell us the amount of drugs that are ingested or taken, uh, or when the last dose was taken, or the source of the medication, or absolute proof of misuse or abuse. We have to be careful with that. And if the patient is believed to be selling or diverting narcotics, and the patient's random urine test confirms no drug use of what the prescription was for, or there's maybe been a forgery or a theft of prescriptions, it's probably best to start the process of discharging that patient, right? Um, and then um, evidence-based guidelines call for monitoring medication compliance with testing protocols that align with the risk level of the patient. So going back to the low, medium, and, and high risk, so the low-level patient risk, that could be testing maybe within six months of starting therapy and then yearly thereafter, whereas the medium, it might be at the point of contact screening and then two to three times a year. And then those high risks, the testing frequency could be once a month and confirming uh, testing for inappropriate or unexplained results. So if we start thinking about improper selection of medications, so in the case I explained earlier, Right. So the first error was prescribing both long-acting morphine and short. So oxycodone in a patient with comorbid respiratory disorders and who was living in shelters and lacked those support systems is probably not the best idea. So start with a single short-acting agent to determine adherence and tolerance. And there needed to be better guidelines in place and more pain management education um, specifically uh, in this office, you know, maybe specifically for this practitioner. So make sure that you're, you're, you're uh, looking at the evidence-based medicine, looking at the CDC guidelines and some of the guidelines coming out from some of the other professional organizations. So then the second error here was suddenly switching the patient to methadone, even though he admitted to selling opioids and purchasing Valium and methadone. So methadone, as we all know, can have effects like significant variations in metabolism, cardiac toxicity, um, and that could have all led up to this guy's death. And a trial of opioid therapy may be in order, but you know, not always, but a drug may not always be best because of some of the, some of the side effects that there may be or lack of benefit for that particular patient. So providers really need to consider opioids as an initial trial with monitoring on an ongoing basis. And remember that they're prescribing opioids as part of a multimodal therapy. So you're also thinking of things like exercise and PT, meditation, counseling, acupuncture, music therapy, art therapy, animal therapy, and many, many, many other types of therapies. So let's also think about the insufficient consideration of comorbid, of comorbid conditions. That could be a problem here. So the assessment. To, to know the underlying clinical pathology to determine what exactly the diagnosis is and the necessity. Obviously, that is very important. And, you know, we all know that chronic pain is associated with a number of neuropathic states. So when we try to define the most appropriate treatment regimen for each person in pain, we can think in terms of buckets, is what I like to refer to as, or categories of treatment. So these categories would include pharmacotherapy, but also interventional or invasive approaches, behavioral strategies, psychological support, lifestyle changes, complementary and alternative approaches, and PM&R, so the physical medicine and rehab approaches. So providers must always be thinking of these multimodal uh, strategies that may include opioids as an appropriate consideration, sure, um, but if possible, um, you know, all these other things, and it should be documented. So a trial of the non-narcotic medication um, and or physical therapy before choosing uh, to place the patient on a controlled substance, all that needs to be documented in the medical record. And, you know, with any other treatment plan, a discussion of the goals, risks, and the benefits, um, and obtaining the patient's consent is very important. We'll get into that in a few minutes. <clears throat> so... Let's, let, let me let just switch a little bit to the legal and the regulatory issues. So when we focus on the legal considerations um, in this area, we're thinking about criminal, criminal, we're thinking about civil, especially medical malpractice, and we're thinking about administrative issues. So some prescribers have lost their license, some have been fined, and some have even been jailed. So, uh, so the criminal area, this is the area where we see most of the problem. So let me just give you, um, we're not going to have time to go through too many of these, but I'll give you 
one that's really uh, interesting. It's from February 2016. So it was a California con uh, physician that was convicted of second-degree murder um, in overdose deaths of three patients. So this is the case of the people versus thing. So this this physician, she is uh, she's serving 30 years to life in prison for fatal overdose. So the court found that this physician was guilty for murder in overprescribing drugs. So this is the first time a physician was convicted of murder in the U.S. for recklessly prescribing drugs. So the doctor tried to blame the patient. The doctor tried to blame the pharmacist and other doctors rather than take responsibility. Now she allegedly wrote. Um, among other things, uh, she allegedly wrote a man's name on prescriptions so that his wife could get twice as many pills and openly referred to her, as, her patients as druggies and sometimes made up medical records. Um, you know, she was convicted of these three uh, 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 murders um, and the patients were in their 20s, right? So one was traveling more than 300 miles with friends to obtain uh, prescriptions from her. Um, she was also found guilty on more than a dozen illegal prescribing counts. So um, she said she doesn't believe that she was ever properly trained in addiction medicine or pain management. So obviously the question is, well, you know, why the hell were you doing it then? So uh, we don't know. But um, it's, it's a cop out to say, oh, I didn't have proper training, uh, and yet you're going off willy-nilly and prescribing all these medications. So that was a case from... Uh, um, from California, you know, and I'll just go over one other case. So recently here in New York, we had Dr. Martin Tesher. Now he's a, um, a family practitioner and he was arrested by federal authorities for excessive prescribing of narcotics. And he is alleged to have prescribed 2.2 million oxycodone pills to patients without a legitimate medical purpose, including those he knew were addicted uh, to the powerful drug. So the millions of pills were among 14,000 illegal prescriptions that He's accused of writing in exchange for cash between 2012 and 2017. So the amount of painkillers were clearly disproportionately higher uh, than what a family doctor like him should have been prescribing. And, you know, he knew some of his patients were hooked on oxycodone or uh, were using other drugs like heroin or cocaine, but he continued writing the prescriptions anyway. So in one case, one of his patients' first visits, uh, he prescribed six, 15 oxycodone pills a day or 450 pills uh, for a 30-day supply without any basic verification that the patient even had uh, an injury. So let's switch over to some of the civil cases. Um, in, in last July, we saw a case uh, that was a $7.6 million verdict against uh, primary care physicians and St. Louis University Clinic. Uh, this is a medical malpractice lawsuit against uh, a Dr. Walden and the St. Louis uh, University. So this case involved um, a physician who made, who clearly made some mistakes, but also the health system that he works for for failing to monitor the drugs he was delivering to his patients. So the case is about a, a city, uh, a bunch of city park employees who went to see Dr. Walden. Uh, he was their their PCT at the uh, at the St. Louis University um, care clinic. Um, but most of them were being treated for back pain, um, and he was prescribing more than 30. 7,000 pain pills between 2008 and 2012, um, and again, at levels that far exceeded what he should have been doing, um, and far exceeded the recommendations from the CDC and other expert professional organizations. And during those four years, the patient's uh, average daily dose of, of morphine equivalent milligrams uh, of opioid medication rose from 49 a day to 1,555 a day. And the most recently re released uh, CDC guidelines call for no more than an average daily dose of 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent uh, opioids. So at one time, he was taking um, uh, Oxycontin, Vicodin, and Oxycodone, and he became addicted um, and evidently uh, ended up in a drug rehab center. So lessons learned from this case is really to comply with the evidence-based medicine. And if you need to refer a patient out for pain management, then basically that is what you should do. Um, and, um, and in this case, this was in Missouri, and at the time, uh, Missouri did not have a PDMP, so the Prescription Data Monitoring Program. Now they do, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, but that was another uh, concern uh, in this particular case. And, um, and we don't have time to go into any other uh, civil med mal cases, but I have several other examples. If anybody's interested, you can email me uh, or give me a call. So in terms of the administrative actions, I'll just go over one. So there was a case in Washington State, so uh, Payette Clinic, 
Um, and there were 60 complaints filed with the Department of Health um, alleging excessive prescribing uh, from this particular clinic and the death of a high school senior uh, who overdosed on oxycodone uh, prescribed uh, to another patient. And so the DEA and the Washington Department of Health uh, got, went in there and um, uh, charges were made against one of the nurse practitioners, including uh, unprofessional conduct. So the state basically stripped her of her privileges to prescribe uh, any Schedule II drugs for two years. Uh, in order to get her privileges back, um, the, uh, the commission ordered her to complete approved graduate level coursework in pain management. Um, so in this particular case, there was no policy at this clinic about obtaining a patient's prior medical records before treating them, right? You would think that would be basic common sense and you wouldn't need a policy on that, but they probably should have had a policy. Um, and they did not have uh, guidelines regarding the amount of opioids to be prescribed to patients. And they did not have guidelines for identifying addiction in patients. So the nurse practitioners use their discretion on whether to monitor patient usage with urinalysis and, and pill counts and things like that. And the nurse practitioners at this clinic, they also admitted to altering prescriptions in order to get um, insurance coverage. So now let's get into some of the risk mitigation strategies. Um, and I know that um, you know a lot of folks are really interested in learning what they can do to make sure that they limit their uh, their liability, you know, especially for medical malpractice case, but you know also from a criminal perspective, but mostly from uh, med mal perspective. So consider a patient scenario where a few minutes before closing time at the clinic, a young woman approaches the registration desk and she asks, um, you know, uh, or she states that she's traveling through the area on her way home to Germany. Let's say. And she anticipated making it home on that long flight to her local doctor before seeking help. Um, but she's had increasing lower back pain, can't continue with her travel, especially sitting on a, on a plane for an extended period of time. So she knows what the problem is, right? Having been treated for degenerative disc disease several times, um, if she can just obtain something to ease her pain, her return home back to Germany would be possible, and she can see her regular doctor. So Oxycontin and Percocet uh, are the only medications that she says has ever helped her pain in the past. Um, she says she has no insurance coverage for her care provided in the U.S. So if you could just get something to help her, if you just give her something to help her with her pain, she'd be extremely grateful. So this physician in this clinic is thinking mm, to simply just write a prescription for a few pills and close up shop after a long day. But on the other hand, he sees a similar request every week or two, and he doesn't want to slip into a practice of inappropriate prescribing. So this gets into the need for objective guidelines, right? So when guidelines are maintained as the focus of the interaction with the patient, it's not necessary to confront patients, right, with, with accusations about their motivations. The focus is going to be on what are the appropriate care guidelines that will not be compromised. So the clinician would want to refer to those guidelines and indicate safe medical practice requires that certain factors are in place before prescriptions for controlled medications can even be written. So this way the patient is in opposition to the safe medical practice rather than the clinician. And the policy will state that in order to provide safe care, controlled drugs will only be dispensed for one-time patients in non-emergency situations if specific conditions are met. So these are that the patient presents a, a photo ID or an ID and a social security number, and then you would get copies to keep in the, in, the, in the registration or the medical record. You get a phone number, and then you, you confirm uh, with a call if possible. Um, the patient offers a medical history, and so you, you would have some contact information for prior care providers, pharmacy, or a hospital. So the clinic you know, could, could contact one of those sources to verify uh, the patient's story. You know, the patient uh, could pay with a check stamp with the name and the address uh, or a credit or a debit card. The patient would undergo an appropriate medical exam, of course, and the patient um, uh, would demonstrate that um, another driver would be taking them away from the clinic if they received any immediate pain medication right there um, at the, you know, at the clinic. So those are just some basic things. So another strategy is to use signage or printed notices given directly to the patient along with the registration materials. So this can be very helpful in discouraging patients who are simply seeking 
narcotic. So they may simply walk out when the likelihood of obtaining the prescription, they, you know, it, 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 it seems like that's not going to happen. So they might just leave. So, um, and when the notice is posted in several areas of the clinic, maybe the entrance, registration desk, the lobby, or included with the printed registration material, it really depends on the clinical setting, um, as well as the persistence and the severity of the drug seeking problem in that area. So the content, um, depending upon the state in which the clinic or the facility is located, it's a good idea to reference the criminal statute, right, related to fraud or deceit in, in obtaining prescription medica medications and or the state's uh, PDMP, so the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. So signs that actually reference active participation in these programs can be a pretty good, uh, effective uh, deterrent. So then we have these drug-seeking uh, patients. So learn how to spot those typical drug-seeking patients. So be careful, though, uh, in the ED. So in the emergency rooms, obviously, we have EMTALA uh, to be concerned about. So where EMTALA applies, uh, the, you know, the, cl the clinicians always need to do a medical screening exam to rule out an emergency medical condition. Uh, and once that's ruled out, the patient can be discharged, right, to follow up with their PCP and or uh, a pain clinic. So many drug-seeking patients will use time pressure, um, uh, you know, and come in at the, at the end of the day or, you know, right after closing. Um, they may claim to be in a hurry to catch a plane. They may actually direct exactly what they want, and they claim to know a lot about certain medications. Or they'll plead ignorance, and then as soon as you say something, they'll latch right onto that. Um, and then um, some may say, you know what, they don't have time for a medical exam. They just want you to, to give them their medication. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a lot of other uh, sort of tips and, and, and cues in that particular um, area. They may be very vague about their medical history. They may claim they have no uh, health insurance. They may claim they lost their prescription. Um, so there's a bunch of, of, of sort of red flags in that area. What about consent issues? So to take the example of a physician who's followed his patients for many, many years, uh, they have a good working relationship until now, and following a recent injury, the patient wants Percocet, uh, and he wants to prescribe to him on a regular basis. So the physician is concerned that he's contributing to his patient's dependence on opioids, and he's worried that the drug use may also be related to the patient's uh, self-medication for depression. So the physician uh, has not really screened the patient for depression in the early phase of prescribing the pain medication. So if the physician refuses to continue prescribing uh, the pain medication, the patient might retaliate. So in another example, the patient who's requested additional pain medication from the surgeon, um, followed by a minor, minor procedure, or, you know, following a minor procedure, receives a second month supply along with the surgeon's release uh, for the patient to return to work and discharge for surgical follow-up. Now, this patient reports to his PCP with ongoing complaints of pain, stating that he can't sleep due to the ongoing discomfort, and the PCP knows that every patient's pain tolerance is unique, right? And some patients need help with their medications as they transition back to work, but two months of opioid prescription is most likely excessive prescribing for an uncomplicated minor procedure. So the patient is now probably dependent on it and addicted to it, um, and you know the physician is not going to assume care for the for the pain problem, so he's going to refer the patient uh, back uh, back out, uh, maybe to the surgeon. So in these two examples described, as with any long-term uh, prescribing. Uh, of opioids for the non-cancer pain, a transition needs to occur. So a shift is required from the acute pain uh, medication process for chronic, uh, the management of the chronic pain. And a corresponding shift in the clinical response is needed. So transition uh, requires three new elements beyond that baseline history and the physical exam and the diagnostic workup. So the clin clinician really needs to have a detailed and documented consent discussion about the risks, the benefits, and the side effects and alternatives to the long-term opioid use. Make sure that the patient gives that informed consent before pres pres uh, proceeding with a prescription for the painkillers. And it's the responsibility of the physician to explain all of the risks associated with the prescription painkillers and to ensure that the patient know how to go about using them in a proper manner. So the patient uh, contract should be agreed to with stringent requirements for the patient uh, behavior continuing to receive the prescription. And we'll discuss that in a minute. 
and then um, documenting the patient's monitoring. So, and we'll go over that um, in, a, in a minute as well. So, um, in New Jersey, there's a specific statute for pain agreements uh, that are now required for treatment of chronic pain. So, um, when a Schedule II controlled dangerous substance or any other prescription opioid drug is continuously prescribed for chronic pain, and they define chronic pain as treatment of three months or longer, um, there's a whole host of things that the, the practitioner uh, should do. So if you're in New Jersey, uh, you want to make sure that you know exactly, um, you know, what that includes. And we don't have time to go into that now, um, but I can point you to that, that statute if you're not aware of what your obligations are. In terms of the pain contract, okay, um, so a controlled substance uh, abuse um, or a controlled substance agreement. So these types of contracts between the patients and the prescribers should be used when uh, when prescribing controlled substances for patients with chronic pain. So this needs to be done in combination with the informed consent process that I talked about. Um, and if the patient has a prior history of drug abuse, refer the patient to a pain management practice or a clinic. And a formal pain management agreement outlines the expectations of the provider and the responsibilities of the patient. So including several key items that I have listed up here, so the baseline screening, Right, and this is urine or serum uh, medication levels, so a periodic unannounced urine or serum toxicology screening. Uh, medications to be used, including the dosages and the frequency of the refills. A requirement that the patient receive medication for o from only one physician and use only one pharmacy. That's important. And the frequency of office visits and the reasons for discontinuation of drug therapy. And that essentially is a violation uh, of the agreement. So just some, real quickly, just some other um, um, uh, strategies that some organizations have put into place, and some, some of them have some pros and some of them have some cons. I've seen some organizations go down the path of these no-narcotic policies. I typically do not encourage these as a good idea because they don't help the providers in prescribing. They actually inhibit clinicians in providing uh, real good care. Um, so if the organization uh, really adopts these uh, strict no-narcotic policies, it can be viewed as judgmental and not treating individual patients and their individual conditions. So what about burns? What about patients that come in with chest pains or COPD? A no narcotic policies, they don't help these types of patients. So the, the best practice is to look at old records and treat patients uh, after doing a thorough clinical assessment. And then flagging patients' charts um, who they suspect of drug seeking the flag could get you into some trouble because they appear all over the medical record and it could be seen as discriminatory by plaintiff counsel if, you know, God forbid there happens to be an issue with a serious safety event. Um, and this can escalate a medical malpractice claim. So in the ED, all patients must get a medical screening exam to rule out an emergency medical condition like I talked about in Tala. So a thorough assessment is always needed regardless of the initial suspicions. So pain assessment is part of ruling out the emergency medical condition. Um, and so that's important to remember. And also any labeling in the medical record as drug seeking, frequent flyers, totally unprofessional and can be seen as discriminatory. So these type of comments also must never be placed in, uh, in the ED log either. So notifying other hospitals of these drug seeking uh, patients, that's a bad idea. If there is a patient on a binge one night, uh, who stops by the ED looking for drugs and clinicians suspect he or she is going down the, the you know, the street of, of hospitals or clinics, uh, to hit them up and, and wants to, uh, call the other EDs in the area to, to, uh, kind of give them a heads up that this person may turn up. It's not a good idea due to confidentiality concerns. And the other EDs, they have to do the medical screening exam anyway, right? So also administering placebos to patients. I've seen it. Uh, you know, who they think uh, are receiving narcotics, not a good idea, unless you're talking about a clinical trial that the patient has agreed to. Otherwise, it's unethical. It should not be done. And then terminating the patient from the practice. So when the patient has failed to abide by a pain contract, sometimes, you know, it's very difficult because the physician may have actually contributed to that addiction. And, um, you know, um, you know, consider, for example, the patient has had, you know, a traumatic kidney injury and was medicated with Vicodin around the clock for three months, and now the physician does not want to prescribe it anymore. Well, this can create a very bad outcome. So the patient may need a referral to an addiction specialist, um, and if the termination is the only option, write a letter to the patient stating uh, objectively and reasonably 
why exactly they're being terminated from care. Um, it might read that they're being terminated because they have not uh, been able to properly follow the plan of care. Um, you know, the clinician will need to give them an exact date when the patient is terminated, and this will usually be with 30 days notice. Um, and the clinician will need to make uh, all, you know, availability for, um, for that time period. And then you refer the patient out if possible and provide resources if needed and offer to send the medical records to them and the next provider and send a certified letter, um, you know, essentially with return requests if you can and document very well in the medical records. Um, don't have a lot of time to go over the CDC guidelines, uh, but know you can get a lot of information on their website. They have a whole portal set up for their recent guidelines, which came out last year for prescribing opioids for chronic pain, right? So uh, there's a lot of great information in there, and it's targeted at chronic pain outside of act active cancer um, and palliative and the end of life care. And it's targeted at PCPs. Um, and, uh, and um, that have patients that are over 18 and at the outpatient level. So, uh, so the, the three areas that are that are listed, and you can read the categories there themselves. We won't have time to go over them. Is determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain. And then the second area is the opioid selection dosage, uh, duration, and the follow-up and the discontinuation. And then the last area is assessing the risk and addressing harm uh, of opioid use. And so um, just, just this week or last week, I saw something that came out from ACOG, for those of you that are um, obstetricians or gynecologists, um, and they released revised guidelines on treatment of opioids uh, during uh, pregnancy. And so there's a lot of great information out there um, from various uh, organizations. The CDC I like a lot because um, there's, a, there's a whole portal and there's a ton of information uh, available out there. Um, and, you know, you think of other issues um, outside of opioid use, but, you know, treating um, with other treatment modalities uh, is also very important. The CDC has also provided some information that we want insurers to take up, right? So many times a patient is covered for pain meds, but yet they're not covered for PT, or the, or the PT may be really expensive. So a copay for your medication could be $8 versus a PT visit could be $100, right? So that's a little that's a little crazy. And then there's unintended consequences of prescribing only a few days or a week of pain medication, right, which is what the CDC recommends, only like a three-day for that acute pain. And so some of the unintended consequences could be um, that you tell your patient that you'll prescribe 10 tablets and that if, if that doesn't, you know, suffice, then there's 10 more if needed. But what does that do? So that means that the patient perhaps needs to get transportation to the pharmacy, right? And they might have to incur a second copay. And that really, you know, from an insurance perspective, that really needs to be looked at. But that's, that's beyond the scope uh, here. And a huge issue, obviously, is communication and education uh, with the patients uh, we serve. So the CDC is making strides to promote awareness. Uh, and again, a lot of information on their website. They have a really cool app, so a mobile app you can download to your to your phone. So all the recommendations are listed for easy reference, and a calculator for determining uh, that MME. And there's an instant messenger feature and a place where you can get feedback and and so forth and so on. So it's a, it's, a, it's there's a lot of good information there. Won't have a lot of time to go into the pain logs, but there are uh, some really good examples from the American Chronic Pain Association. For, uh, for pain logs and how you can do some graphing of some of the, uh, some of the pain logs and there's some apps associated with as well. Um, and so let's switch gears real quickly, uh, in the last closing, uh, time that we have here to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the prescription drug monitoring programs, um, throughout, uh, the country. So here we have a, a, a chart and some of the data that's being used for painkillers. Uh, in a way that was not intended. So here, um, this chart depicts sources of prescription painkillers for non-medical users. And this is based upon um, some information that comes out of JAMA uh, in 2014. So the data here shows that many people who abuse prescription opioids for non-medical use, they actually get these medications for free from a friend or perhaps from a relative. And that's represented here by, uh, by the gray bar in the graph. However, those that are at the highest risk of overdose, 
So that's using prescription opioids non-medically 200 or more days a year. They get them in a way that are different from those who use them less frequently. And this is dis displayed in that far right side. So these people get opioids using their own prescriptions by more than one prescriber, and that's 27%. And from friends or relatives uh, for free, that's 26%. And buying from friends or relatives, 23%, or buying from a drug dealer, 15%. So this tells us there's a problem with obtaining opioids from one or more physicians for those heavy users. So the next chart here shows some states that have more opioids prescribed per person than others. And prescribing rates for opioids vary widely. And this is based upon 2014. And I mentioned this earlier in the, in, in the, in the webinar that the CDC report uh, that just came out this summer indicated that. And so healthcare providers uh, in the highest prescribing states wrote almost three times as many opioid pain prescriptions per person as those in the lowest prescribing states. So healthcare issues that may cause pain do not vary much from place to place and don't explain this variability in, pres in prescribing. But some factors that may influence prescribing rates include healthcare providers in different parts of the country don't necessarily agree. Um, when to prescribe opioid pain sellers and how much to prescribe. So some of the in increased demand for prescription opioids is from people who use them non-medically, so using without a prescription or just for the high they cause, who sell them or who obtain them for multiple uh, prescribers. And many states report problems with these for-profit high volume pain clinics, the pill mills, uh, that prescribe large quantities of painkillers to people who don't need them medically. So let me tell you a little bit about the PDMPs, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Programs. I'm sure you're all very aware of them, but we'll just spend a couple of minutes. So these are the statewide electronic databases that collect the designated information on controlled substances dispensed by the pharmacies. So all states in D.C. have passed statutes establishing a program uh, and provide authorized users access to that information. So the PDMPs contain important clinical data that can help ID those patients at risk for opioid-related overdoses and they can inform providers of other meds that the patient is prescribed that may interact with those prescribed. And they can ID those patients with, uh, with, that are struggling with abuse. So the information allows for a conversation with the patient about their risk for opioid dependence and overdose and death. And so those states with the mandatory prescriber inquiry, right, before the controlled substance is prescribed is actually the best approach. And if it's voluntary, we know we're only gonna get partial compliance. So the web links here are where uh, you can view some of the reports on the PDMPs. This is an old chart. Missouri now does have a, a statute. So, and that just passed just recently, uh, or, you know, earlier this year. So this photo here, and this is, um, you can get this at the link down at the, at the bottom. Uh, so this photo of the U.S. shows data collection intervals throughout the U.S. So the data collection interval is the time within which a dispenser, right, to the pharmacy of the medication is required to submit dispensing information to the PDMP. So the rules vary from state to state, and ultimately what is needed, I think, is a nationwide mandated prescriber use of the PDMP every time when prescribing opioids and other key controlled substances, perhaps. And then that timely entry and review of the dispensing data is the real time uh, you know, data, and that maximizes the utility of the prescription history data. And in addition, using that PDMP uh, for data, um, you know, the, the, the data that comes out of that for public health surveillance, also uh, very important. And it's very important to make sure that these PDMPs integrate into our workflow system, right? So into the, the electronic uh, medical records and so forth and so on. And make sure that you integrate the PDMP into systems so that when there is an overdose, to make sure that there's a flag of some sort, right, and so that you can stop that patient from getting medication when there was an overdose. Um, here's a couple of examples. New York has done a really good job. Um, Tennessee has done a really good job, and Illinois has done a really good job. So let's we'll just talk about Illinois just for um, for a second. So their system is updated weekly, and even though it's only voluntary for prescribers. Uh, there's a query function for most of the electronic medical records. So it's LinkedIn, right? So dispensers must 
uh, put the data in the system within the next business day, right? So, but, but from 2013 to 2015, Illinois saw a 10% reduction in opioid prescriptions being filled. So that's pretty impressive. And I have more information on the other states. If anybody's interested, you can contact me and we can talk about that uh, at a later time. So let me just spend a minute uh, talking about the regulatory oversight um, of controlled uh, substances. So there's the state and the federal authorities that do investigations and criminal prosecutions, and they're actually increasing. So be aware of what laws are involved in prescribing uh, um, you know, and, and in drug abuse cases. So they include the federal and the state controlled substance, uh, uh, the Controlled Substances Act, and that's where your drugs are listed, but also the State Medical Practice Act and the State Prescribing Authority Act. So that directs clinical practice, right, in your state. So there's also the DEA, there's the OIG of Health and Human Services, and there's the, the state medical board agents. There's also state narcotic agents and the police. And they may all come in and they may all be conducting these investigations. So in many cases, the authority's attention um, comes in via reports of patient deaths from prescription overdoses, a review of pharmacy, uh, uh, patient records for signs of patient drug-seeking behavior. It could come in through a review of, of doctors' prescribing rates. It could come in through tips from pharma uh, from the uh, from the pharma uh, distributors about doctors who order an unusual high amount of painkillers for dispensing. It could come in through suspicion of drug diversion by the pharmacy or from the doctors or patients or even office staff. Um, there are some cases where they've used undercover informants seeking prescriptions. And then there's also media reports about certain uh, practitioners and citizen complaints to law enforcement or medical boards. So here are some of the other organizations. It's not just the CDC, um, but there's support for non-opioid options coming in from the Joint Commission, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and uh, Health and Human um, Resources. The AMA support is very strong, and they support evidence-based training and prescribing, uh, comprehensive treatment of pain to include a multimodal approach, including awareness of substance abuse and treatment regimens, uh, use of Narcan in high-risk patients, and increased protection for Good Samaritans, who help to try to rescue patients who are in emergency situations um, from an overdose, uh, for example. So in conclusion, my recommendations are to make sure that you're following evidence-based medicine, like the CDC guidelines for provider education, for the insurer interventions, and for patient awareness and education. Follow the evidence-based medicine to guide screening with consideration of the comorbid conditions, the diagnosis, selection of appropriate treatment, um, and focus monitoring of adherence to the therapy course. So the CDC is working with 61 medical schools, not just on one lecture, uh, but throughout the entire curriculum. And they're putting it into the assessment process and case studies, um, continuing education for older providers. They're also uh, concerned that there's, there's um, you know, a need to, to continue uh, the education. Um, we also, and, and this is a personal thing, so we have the DEA licensure requirements. They need to be amended, in my opinion, to mandate targeted training focused on pain medication upon initial application and renewal of license. Many, actually most states require that, um, but not for your DEA license. What about uh, buprenorphine certification? It's required, um, but uh, for, you know, for, for that certification, but there's no certification required for prescribing opioids. Well, why not? Maybe that should be something we should be thinking about. From a state's perspective, look at some of the great initiatives going on with some of the states. Massachusetts, for example, they form a field task force with nine recommended best practices for managing opioids in the ED. Um, and the guidelines include uh, everything from refusing to replace lost or stolen uh, controlled substances to counseling ED visitors on how to store and dispose of, uh, of medication properly. And all 51 Massachusetts uh, Hospital Association member EDs have put the recommendations in place. And at one of the organizations, uh, Beth Israel Plymouth, in five months after the implementation, had a 25% decrease in prescriptions. And now they're going into phase two, which includes developing the same uh, best practices for every other area of the institution uh, where prescriptions are written. So in the surgical area, and inpatient, and so forth, um, and so on. And then from a federal perspective, and I'll close on this, 
is be aware of the 21st Century Cures Act. It was signed into law in December of 2016, and it, con it contains a billion dollars in grants to states to expand their prescription opioid and heroin abuse prevention and treatment initiatives, such as the training of healthcare providers, improving the PDMPs, and implementing prevention activities, and expanding access to opioid treatment programs. And like I said earlier, my, my, what I think is the best practice is to have a nationwide mandated real-time dispenser database that requires verification every time a clinician prescribes opioids and other key controlled substances, um, and that you can see all state's data. So I've provided here some resources and some tools, uh, some of the references to some of the material that I gave today, um, and I continue for, uh, or I, I encourage you all to continue to be on top of the state and the federal developments, and please, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. And my information uh, is listed uh, up here. I know I went a little bit long, uh, but I think this is a really important topic. We're all facing this. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them now. Mike, Thanks, thank you so much. Um, we do have a little bit of time here. I, I, we may not get to all the questions, and we can certainly address the rest offline. Um, if a patient, family member of a patient or employee suspects inappropriate prescribing of pain medication, where should they file a complaint to initiate an investigation? Right, so that would be state dependent, okay? So in certain states, it may be the Department of Health. Um, so you really have to look at the state laws. Um, if that person wants to email me offline about their particular state, um, I could probably provide you with, uh, you know, some specific uh, link to that Department of, of Health or whatever it might be for that particular state. Right. And I do think the State Medical Board is also another, you know, good place to start. Um, and what do you suggest as best practice for coordination of both monitoring and prescribing of such a patient as one with multiple diverse site providers? So. Um, somebody is coming from a bunch of different providers. Well, I mean, it's important to have that conversation with the patient about, um, you know, what other providers they're going to see. But with the PDMP, if you're querying that PDMP and you're looking to see what other uh, uh, opioids or, you know, other medications that have been prescribed, um, you're going to be able to get that information and then you can have that conversation with the patient that, you know, you have identified that they're, they're on all these different medications or they disclose that to you. And so there, there should be one provider and that, you know, that could be the pain management specialist or it could be the PCP that should be coordinating all that activity. And you should look toward, you know, the different risks. So the high, low, medium risks in terms of exactly how frequently uh, that monitoring should take place. Uh, drug testing to determine abuse of opioid or illegal drug uh, use, is this urine, blood, and or hair follicle? Well, I mean, essentially most providers are doing urine, uh, but there could be certain circumstances where you would want to do serum, you know, get that blood draw. Um, it, dep it depends on the condition uh, that you're treating. It, it just depends on your relationship with your patient and what you think is the best um, the best practice. If you go on to the CDC website and you look at some of the recommendations from the guidelines, um, there's additional information uh, listed there. Uh, should all patients on chronic opioids be required to submit to a urine drug test on a routine basis? You know, I, I you know, after completing your abuse risk assessment of the patient and assigning the patient into an abuse risk class that's low, medium, or high. The prescriber should determine if and when the urine drug test is necessary. So look at the evidence-based medicine clinical guidelines for specific recommendations on that, that stratification of the risks for the patients maintained on chronic opioid therapy. Generally, your high-risk patients need more monitoring uh, and repeat assessment. Okay, and last question. What is the best way to assess liability issues with a pain clinic? Okay, so if you're uh, the risk manager or the medical director or the patient safety person at your pain clinic, I recommend using an enterprise risk management approach to assess risk in eight different areas. And if you want more information on enterprise risk management, please email me. I have a lot of information. I teach this. Um, but those eight different areas are, are clinical and patient safety risks, legal and regulatory risks, human capital risks, technology, operations, hazards, 
uh, strategic and financial. So all of these different type of risks you would identify, and then you would rank them according to their severity in your clinic, the likelihood that they're going to happen, and the velocity, or how quickly you think they're going to impact the, or the organization. And then you would have a risk ranked uh, inventory, and you could give priority to those areas that need uh, the highest attention, that pose the most risk uh, to your clinic. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Mike, so much for joining us today. Um, please use his contact information on the screen for any questions, or if you send us questions, we will forward them on to him. You can register for uh, any future webinars uh, on our website at 1sthcc.com. You can also request a demo of our compliance solution or call us at 888-543-4778. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you.